than ever. I think you can have politicians state or base their arguments on research shows. What does that really mean? Well, it means that um, politicians base some of their policy making on scientific results, on reports, on research that has been conducted. For a university, that is, uh, I think, good news. For academics, it's good news, because that means that our knowledge is in demand. To a large extent and ever, it uh, forms policy, or it informs policy. It contributes to the formation of policy, national-wise, obviously, but also on, on a national level. So it influences diplomacy to a much larger extent than ever before. If that is to happen, of course, the science that we conduct, the knowledge that we create, must be of a certain standard. We cannot compromise on uh, the um, quality of our research. And that's why it's so important that when we invest in research, that we think is of interest uh, for policy makers, nationally and internationally in the longer run. We also need to realize, or we have to realize, that uh, short-termism in how we invest and prioritize in research is of no good, whether to, uh, when it's to, to science itself, or research or academic life in itself, or to policy or diplomacy. In um, a period of time where politicians as I said, state more often than ever. Research shows, of course, that uh, gives universities a more prominent role than ever. And at our university, we um, have tried to realize this, and we launched a new strategy a year ago or something like that. And uh, the, the uh, vision for, for our university in the years to come is uh, well, it demonstrates that we do realize that knowledge in, a, in this era when um, knowledge-based society is on high on the most politicians' agenda, we realize that knowledge it actually shapes society. It influences society. And uh, that means that universities has a prominent role in the development of uh, our societies, more than ever, obviously. That means that we need to interact, and we are expected to interact with society to a much larger extent in the earlier days. That demands, um, or the, that puts some demands on us as, as institutions, but it also provides us with an opportunity that we've never had before. If we are, if we, if we, um, or let's say that, if universities and institutions like ours, if our contribution to policy making, to international diplomacy and to a knowledge based society uh, to have value, as I said, we need to base our strategies on quality. That's why we also enhance the um, or focus on the importance of excellence in research. High quality is. Uh, of paramount importance for us to succeed. So one of the, the um, core components of our strategy is that we need to, to base our knowledge on research of excellent or high quality. One way that we have discussed how to interact with society in, that is in the locally, uh, in our region, in our area, is to engage in knowledge clusters. Of course, it's not like that anymore, that universities are the only institutions that conduct research. We see that there are other public institutions, there are research institutes, there are organizations, there are the public sector uh, actors, but there are also private enterprises that invest and conduct uh, research. So that means that we need to engage in a different way than early on. Knowledge clusters is one way of uh, collaborating with knowledge actors beside ourselves. That's also a part of our strategy. And of course, educating people. How, 
how can you possibly contribute to, to societal development, policy making, informed uh, policy making, uh, but also to uh, and, uh, development of the international societies without paying attention to the students. Students and education is obviously important, but at universities, I think it's also important for us to realize that what we can provide depends also on the research that we conduct. So students should engage in research and we should engage students in our research activities. So that means that research-based education is um, or have a value that universities need to pay attention to. If we are able to uh, engage students in the research, I think the research will benefit from that. And definitely the students will benefit from their engagement in the, so to speak, co-creation of new uh, insight that re research is all about. Science research knowledge does not evolve, develop, is created in a vacuum or in a local uh, university or an area. International collaboration is high on everybody's agenda. Obviously, that's why we're also here. We need to engage with other universities. We need to collaborate with other research groups worldwide. And in topics of uh, high priority in our institution, the USP is uh, an uh, a extremely interesting collaborative university for our, for, from, for our, from our point of view. We have um, three prioritized areas that I'd like to mention for uh, uh, today. And marine research, due to the close proximity to the oceans and seas for our university, uh, marine research is an obvious choice or an ob obvious uh, area where we focus on. And with a, with a number of other institutions conducting research in the marine field in Bergen, I think we can safely say that approximately 1,000 marine researchers in various aspects of, of marine research, research on the, with respect to the oceans, is what we can draw upon as a knowledge base. We would like to engage also internationally to a large extent and make the best possible use of our local resources in conducting marine research that can also serve as uh, information or base for, for, for policy uh, making. Climate and energy transition is the second one which I'd like to highlight because climate change is something that we also well, know affect our societies and where we know that we need new policies, but we know also need to base these policies on research. And at a, at a climate, uh, or the, sorry, the Birkner Center for Climate Research in Bergen, we do have a strong tr tradition and a, a rock solid research environment that can produce this um, knowledge. Climate, marine research are areas that we would like to collaborate along with the uh, USP on. In Bergen, it started back in 1825 with a museum. A museum where um, artifacts was collect collected and uh, a, what con uh, cons uh, constituted of two divisions, a, a cultural um, museum and also a national historic museum. But uh, those who formed this museum realized that only having exhibits and exhibitions didn't really matter to a young nation as Norway was at the time. We need to, to uh, conduct research based on these uh, exhibitions or exhibits and the collections. And you need to uh, disseminate the knowledge that is created. So actually research was created at, uh, or conducted, sorry, at this museum way before the University of Bergen was established many, many years later on. Today it has evolved into a medium-sized university of 15,000 students, 1,500 PhD students and a number of staff uh, a bit below 4,000. And we have an annual budget of approximately 1.1, I think, billion uh, Fiji dollars. 
And uh, one fifth of this funding comes from uh, external money or is external money. That means EU and other uh, grant uh, sources where you have to compete for the money. But that means that you also have to collaborate with institutions like USB in order to succeed in your applications for research funding. Students is at the core of a university. We do conduct research, of course, you need to create a new insight and knowledge, but the professors is hardly those who is going to make use of this in a societal uh, setting. It is the students. And of course, therefore, the students is core to our activity and they spread around or distribute around a number of various faculties at our institution. And what I think is important for us to realize in the years to come that yes, even though you study marine uh, research or the natural science component of marine issues, you need to also to realize that stewardship of the seas is also related to social science approaches, to legal issues, economical issues, etc., but also ethical issues. So it might not be sufficient anymore just to study the biology of uh, marine species. Perhaps we need to compose our, our, stu our studies in a slightly more flexible or, let's say, holistic way than early on. I mentioned knowledge clusters. And uh, at the University of Bergen, we, have, uh, we are working on a number of, of knowledge clusters, but I'd like to highlight uh, two of them here today marine research cluster where we try to gather all the uh, um, knowledge actors in our region to uh, focus on marine research in a broader perspective with various focuses. We think that that is uh, important because research is uh, on the transformation. We cannot, as individual or single professors or researchers, address the big societal challenges the way we used to do or the, uh, the way we used to conduct research. So that means that we need to draw upon uh, various, various disciplines in order to understand the big in order to um, grasp the, the complexity of uh, challenges we face today. Of course that also goes for climate uh, challenges or the, the changes in the climate we see and the consequences uh, um, associated with that. Two of these clusters, the marine research cluster and the climate research cluster, uh, aim at addressing some of the perhaps most uh, important society challenges that we face, stewardships of the seas and uh, sustainable, um, uh, the sustainable growth in, for example, uh, aquaculture and uh, uh, exploitation of the, the marine resources we've got. And how do we cope with the climate change uh, as one of, or two of, uh, two examples of, of the Grand Society challenges. And we would like all our partners, uh, international partners, to uh, collaborate also along these uh, lines to a large extent than early on. We think that engaging various disciplines. It might not only be academic disciplines, but it might also be uh, actors, knowledge actors outside academia in order to address this in a holistic manner from various perspectives. Give us a possibility to understand also how to deal with these challenges way beyond the traditional academic ways of, of addressing research questions. Norway is an extremely small country far up north. Bergen is an even smaller city, and uh, our university is a medium-sized <coughs> European university, and it's not even extraordinarily old. We uh, adhere, of course, to the academic traditions, but we also realize that uh, we, cannot, we cannot meet our own, uh, um, our own criteria, ambitions when it comes to research and educational uh, quality if we do not engage uh, internationally. And as I said initially, 
research is not a local discipline or a national discipline, a regional discipline. It is uh, about engaging in an international endeavor because knowledge need to be shared, not locally only, not regionally only, but internationally. So, the key to success in this increasingly competitive world is that our teaching and research holds the highest quality and that the academic environment remains attractive potential partners. That's the international setting we face. That's why we also engage in, that in various networks. We exchange students and staff and we would like to see even more student exchange and staff exchange between our two universities. And we have opened, op uh, opened offices in Tokyo and Brussels. Brussels obviously because of funding um, and the opportunities to, uh, let's say, influence the calls for research funding in EU. But we also know that presence in other parts of this globe is important for us. We have study centers and international centers in many, many countries. Uh, but um, now we have opened offices that can sort of see to it that we uh, maintain our collaboration and uh, with uh, special emphasis of research funding. We do have an international profile. One third of our academic staff is um, from abroad. That is uh, important for us because it gives, it gives an international flavor to our campus, but it also forms our international network. That's why it's so important that also more than one of the, one of the three of our PhD students come from abroad, and a bit more than 10% of the, the student population. And we have a separate, uh, or uh, we have a, a vice director of international relation. She's not with us uh, because uh, uh, to, uh, She's not been with us here today because she is in South Africa with a, a um, Norwegian delegation down there headed by the um, uh, Ministry of uh, Research and Education. And we look at student mobility as one way of uh, developing our international network. More students should um, spend a semester or more in uh, at other universities, but we also invite students to come uh, to our university, and we see that it grows year by year. But we could, or well, we aim at even more student or a higher student mobility than than we've seen so far, and we stimulate uh, to that. Research is, as I said, important, and knowledge creation through research is something that forms the or should inform policy. But then, of course. Uh, in a global scale, when it comes to the science for diplomacy, I think it's also fair to say that the international collaboration between research groups throughout this globe, between various universities, is, is important. Co-authorship is one way of looking at uh, international collaboration. It's obvious like that, that US and the United Kingdom is um, the biggest uh, part of the partners where we can see the biggest uh, share of co-authorship because simply they conduct a lot of research and they are big countries. But we do see an increasing interest in co-authorship, that means uh, co uh, collaboration and thereby also co-authorship of research publications with Asian countries and the uh, emerging economies. But we are proud to say that we do have co-authorship and therefore also collaboration with a number of in, uh, countries and institution, institutions globally. Research must have impact. Impact on the international research um, environment or the international research community, but it must also have impact, of course, or it could possibly have impact when it comes to policy making, as I said. But then it has to at least have a certain penetration. So that means that we take certain pride in that our university's citation index, which is a indication of research quality, but also the interest that other research environments, groups, researchers take in our uh, research and uh, research result and shows the penetration of our research. And uh, in Norway, uh, our university is quite good, and uh, there's approximately 50% above 
the um, global average. And that means that what we produce our research is of interest to other researchers. And I think that's important because it's about sharing, sharing the results that we can achieve. And I'm pretty sure that we are, if we are even better in collaborating, we'll see that the presentation of our research will uh, increase. So why is it important to conduct research? Well, research simply, or science, simply for the sake of science. That means knowledge creation in itself is important. And in the long run, we'll see that this kind of knowledge, this kind of scientific results will also have an impact on society. And as I said initially, we see to an increasing extent that pol policymakers and politicians state that or argues along these lines that research shows. Why is this important? Well, I think that there are a number of areas where science is uh, of utmost importance and crucial for policy making. We mentioned climate change, economic capacity building, conflict resolution and resource scarcity around the globe is, for example, well, that's uh, four topics where policy making and the um, diplomatic uh, relations between various countries well, should be um, based on or could be informed by the science, uh, or sorry, the, the scientific results that we um, create. If you look at the globe and where challenges, uh, or some of these challenges uh, occur and where policy making is developed and also where diplomatic <coughs> efforts need to engage in order to resolve these uh, conflicts, problems, etc. You can see there it's, well, it's spread, distributed over the globe and uh, it focuses also on the grand societal challenges to a large extent as defined by EU, no, sorry, by uh, UN. This map is um, probably from the Royal Society and from a publication called The Frontiers in Science Diplomacy a few years ago. It hasn't uh, changed a lot. But it means that science can inform policy, need to inform uh, um, policy making perhaps, and definitely engage in diplomacy between nations in order to resolve conflicts, to, to um, combat climate change, to um, deal with hunger and uh, coastal risks for um, just to mention a few. There are three, let's say, versions of um, science and diplomacy. Science in diplomacy is informing foreign policy objectives. Diplomacy for science is also an issue and then it's about fac facilitating international science cooperation. International, <coughs> sorry, international science cooperation is also an important part in people-to-people um, -people, um, relationships and developing these kind of relationships. In Europe, um, we have this great or really big um, research facility called CERN, which is one of uh, an example of this facilitating international science cooperation. So that is science for diplomacy, but also that kind of science is a sound base for the diplomatic activities between the countries. And then we've got science for this diplomacy, using science cooperation to improve international relations between nations. If um, you look at a, a slightly more detailed um, not map, but to some details with respect to how the uh, how science as a, a kind of soft power can interplay with um, diplomacy. You can see that um, the soft power science interacts with all levels of diplomacy, from the more traditional ways of conducting diplomacy to the public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy, and all three these three components is of uh, importance with respect to the diplomatic um, activities and uh, between countries and understanding between countries and people-to-people -people, uh, collaborations and cooperations. Of course, it's important with respect to, 
to disagreements that occur, but it's also, in the end of the day, critical to the cooperation between countries. And the soft power, because I think it's fair to say that science can, can execute soft power in a number of uh, ways and on large forms uh, in national diplomacy. So Peter Gluckman is the science advisor to uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister. And uh, on a visit to Norway, he emphasized a number of issues that is related to the challenges, and, but also the po possibilities and the nature of, of uh, science in, in uh, diplomacy and also for policy making. And uh, one could or should, of course, when it comes to the diplomacy component, focus on the global interest and the sustainable development goals that was launched by the United Nations is one of those areas where science needs to be engaged and need to uh, be a core component on the policy making, obviously, but also the diplomatic uh, efforts and aspects. If you look at uh, the um, common interests that uh, are shared between nations and where science can contribute of course, we've got crisis and disaster management, but also big science as something that is a shared a common interest to a number of our countries in order to deal with, let's say, healthcare problems, but also when it comes to um, management of, or stewardship of the seas and various other uh, topics that we need, but that we know that we are investi um, investing uh, these days or we're investing into these days. If you look at the, the national interests, where perhaps the policy, the national policy, comes into play to a large extent, uh, we know we realise that uh, it is the soft power of, of science that, on the science advice level, could uh, contribute to policy making, perhaps to the largest extent. We do know that um, there are various region or areas where where national policy is developed and where science can contribute and we talk about for example security crisis threatens the economic uh, development but also other national needs for for uh, and capacity building in in the, within the country, various countries i think we can safely say that there are five different elements to uh, to science diplomacy or how it works of course uh, there is regional predominance uh, prominence and China and India is an example of that. Capacity develop, development, for example, through education is of utmost importance in that respect. And of course, I mentioned CERN as an example of joint infrastructure development, uh, but there are also a number of other joint infrastructure developments. So setting up these kind of facility is a, an example of how nations need to, to work together. And of course, that's an example of a well-functioning diplomacy. I think it's fair to say that USP, with all its nations that is behind this institution, is an ex um, uh, very good example of not a joint infrastructure, but a joint uh, effort um, in order to jointly set up education and research between various countries, with a great success, I'm um, happy to say. Open access knowledge, distribution, of course, and public engagement core components of science diplomacy work, but there are also some hurdles, barriers. It is, or it becomes extremely difficult if there are severe asymmetries in the capacity. It might also be that um, economic or security concerns with respect to technology, but also knowledge in, in general, um, or the access to knowledge and technology in general, that there are concerns related to that. There might also be legal or national or political restrictions on exchange, exchange of students, exchange of staff, research of scientists. And of course, it becomes very difficult to contribute also to, to policy making and diplomacy uh, from a science perspective if um, you don't have the budgets needed to conduct research and education, to conduct um, as, or to execute the soft power that the science can. I think it's, um, I do have one or more, there it is. We've heard about Moana, the rising of the sea earlier today by the Provost Chancellor. 
that was um, an extraordinary event taking place in um, Norway, in Bergen, um, slightly more than a year ago. It is about communicating research results in a totally different, new and innovative way than uh, we <coughs> normally do. It is all about executing soft power. It's based on science that we've conducted. It's based on the notion that um, climate change has a huge impact on societies. How can you communicate that? Well, you can write research papers. No politicians will ever read them. You can um, write a few sentences on a, a sheet of paper and politicians will read that and uh, they will be perhaps advised also if they have the science advisors like Sir Peter Gluckman, the uh, science advisor to the New Zealand PM. But there are also, uh, there are also other ways of uh, conveying this message and executing soft power. Artistic performance is one of uh, one such way where also science and science results can be disseminated. This took place um, in uh, Bergen and uh, as a part of the uh, Bergen International Festival, which is a big event. And um, it also made it to the front page of the local newspaper. And um, this was um, definitely the favorite of uh, the Norwegian's, Norwegian Prime Minister. The opening took place in front of uh, our Queen, Queen Sonia, and the Prime Minister. And uh, the Prime Minister said that this was the most exciting thing she had seen or witnessed uh, during the opening of that international festival. And we do know that uh, one of the Rising of the Sea travelled throughout Europe with exactly the same message. It is all about executing uh, soft power based on uh, knowledge, research and science, engaging much more widely with the public and the politicians. And I think that's why also science has a role to play without or outs, um, in addition to, to strengthening the, the knowledge base in general. Science for science is important, but it's also important to execute good science for policy and uh, diplomacy and perhaps for a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Rector. I feel like you've reminded us why we're here at a university as well, because you've so beautifully encapsulated why we do research, why we pursue knowledge, and why we translate it, as Moana has done. So, nakavakilev. So, our next speaker, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background because you may not always understand what the role of climate research centers are. So, I came to USP from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. So, I came from the US at one of the biggest centers that's devoted to climate change research in the world. We would sit at that center and admire what was going on at this smaller center in a much smaller country on the other side of the planet. And we would say, have you noticed what's going on over there at the Bjergne Center? And the Bjergne Center always had the highest respect of my superiors, of the entire National Center for Atmospheric Research focused on atmospheric dynamics, atmosphere, and ocean coupling. So when I received an invitation to become a visiting fellow at the Bjergne Center, I said, of course, I'll come. So I came in uh, November, in the dark days of November of 2011. While I was a visiting fellow at the Bjergne Center, I received an offer from the University of the South Pacific to take up the position I now hold. So I see this as a closing of the loop for us to host Professor Jorde Vudovic from the director of the Bjergnes Center. And it is my personal honor and privilege to host the director. 
but it is also the university's honor and privilege to host the director of such an innovative world leader in climate research. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt, for these uh, very kind words. So, um, I would also thank for the invitation to come here. It's been really a pleasure so far. So, we came yesterday morning after, I think we had it, it was 39 hours on uh, planes and airports. So, we were tired, but uh, when we came to this beautiful spot, and especially the beautiful weather this today, it's been really been uh, amazing so far. So, I'm also looking forward to the next couple of days before we are leaving again. <clears throat> so, as it was said, Bergen is exactly or more or less exactly on the opposite side of the globe. So my family are now going, I said they are going upside down compared to me on the other side. And um, still, I think there are similarities between Fiji and Norway. So, so we are both countries that are more or less living of what we can get from the sea. So we are living of fisheries, or resources from the ocean, and also we have climates that are very much depending on what we get from the ocean. So the sea surface temperatures, either in the Pacific or the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic, are very much influencing the weather. What we get, the rainfall in Bergen and Finsen, are coming from the, from the ocean. And uh, I will give you a little bit of flavor about what we are doing at the Bjerkner Center. So I have a few slides just describing the center. And then I will show some examples of research we are conducting related to the Pacific. And uh, especially towards the end of this lecture, most slides they are from uh, my very good colleague in Bergen, Noel Kielisheim, who, who is also collaborating with Beth Holland and, uh, and USP. So that will be mainly focusing, focusing on, on this region. Bjerkner uh, Center, we started up in year 2000, we had, had funding from the Research Council, we have no funding directly from the government. It's, it's a very large climate research centre, we are probably one of the two or three large And we have 200 scientists working on the climate system. It's uh, almost all of these scientists are concentrating on the natural sciences, so it's more on understanding how the climate system works. We are looking into past climate, we are looking into present climate, into future climate. We have people doing field work out in the ocean, up in the mountains. We have geologists up at, on the ice of Greenland. And we are modelers, we are theoreticians. So it's a whole complexity of, of climate sciences. Dr. Uh, Rune Olsen, he mentioned the uh, international character of University of Bergen. But I will say the Bjerkner Center were even more international. We have 60% of our staff is actually coming from outside Norway. And this map shows where our staff is coming from. And you see we have people from all continents on the globe. And um, we don't have anyone from Fiji Island yet, but uh, perhaps that will be in the future. Uh, the Bjerkner Center are there any meteorologists in the audience or anyone working on climate sciences? Perhaps, perhaps not. But the Bjerkner Center is, is named after two very important meteorologists coming from Norway. And one, Willem Bjerkner, he was the one who actually, I would say, taught the world how you could do modern weather forecasts. So if you now, if you have enough observations, you can use the physical laws to predict weather. So that's the foundation of weather forecast. <laughs> and his son, Jak, or Jakob Bjerknes, he was started out as a meteorologist, but he became more and more a climate scientist. So he did pioneering works on how the ocean and atmosphere interacted, how small perturbations, small fluctuations in either the ocean or in the atmosphere could grow 
and become large climate fluctuations. And he was the first one to explain, for instance, how the El Nino solar oscillation in the Pacific, how that operated. What was the mechanism for these large fluctuations that we have in the Pacific, which I will come back to. So they both have been very important for weather forecasts and also for climate research. So we are really proud to, to have these two as our, what should I say, our, or have they given the names to our center. And I will just show this very briefly. So we are organized into different research groups. So we have one group doing climate modeling. So these, the model we have at the Bjerkner Center is giving data for the IPCC. So we are one of the models, or model centers giving data to IPCC and becoming the foundation, of course, for climate policies. We have one group that's a growing group led by Noel Kinley as I refer to, is doing climate prediction. So that it not, it's not the same as the climate scenarios, but climate prediction, we want to forecast how is the climate, well, how will the climate be the next winter or the next summer, so on monthly or seasonal timescales, and how will the climate evolve during the next couple of years, or even up to decades. And this group is also doing dome scaling, so that mean, means we would like to produce climate information so on regional scales. So data that can go into more like into climate adaptation studies or data that can go more into climate policies. So that's two very important groups. And I will also mention the third group that's on carbon cycle and biogeochemistry. And I also on I think it's fair to say that this is the largest group in Europe doing working looking into the carbon cycle. So the CO2 uptake in the ocean and also the, the impacts on the ocean. And ocean acidification is one of the main threats when it comes to future, the future. And I think in all these three, and especially number two and three here, I think there should be clear links between what we are doing in Bergen, Norway, and also what I think would be very useful for USP. So this is something that we want to collaborate more on. Just a few slides on the evolution of climate. So I guess you have all seen figures like this. So this is the global mean temperature, uh, global mean surface temperature change from 1890s until present. And you can just see how extremely rapid the temperature has increased the last couple of years. So 2014 set a new record, 2015 was an extremely high record. And if we just give the forecast or expectations for this year, we will end up on a new temperature record, much, much higher than what we have had before. So there have been extremely large temperature increase globally during the last couple of years. And uh, there are many reasons for this. But one very clear reason is what's going on in the Pacific and related to the El Nino in the Pacific. 